Hello everyone, this is Dr. Chris Link, Medical Director at the Integrated Medicine Clinic. Today's talk is about osteoporosis, the prevention and treatment, really how to have better bones naturally, because we're going to look at the integrative approaches to help improve bone health. And of course, at the Integrated Medicine Clinic, we're always looking to provide the very best care for our patients by combining both conventional medicine at its very best and integrative approaches that bring these together in such a way that patients have the very best outcomes. Osteoporosis is a, is a major public health concern and a major cause of pain, disability, and premature death in women and in men. Adults with osteoporosis and, for example, fractures of their spine, which are very common in osteoporosis, have decreased mobility. They have an increased risk of falling. They have decreased lung function or pulmonary function as their thoracic cage area becomes lessened. And actually, as their vertebrae begin to collapse, they, they have less room in their abdominal cavity and less gastric capacity as well. People with osteoporosis often have a shortened lifespan. We're going to look at important integrative approaches to improve bone health from nutrition to appropriate vitamin D, calcium, vitamin K2, estrogen, probiotics, silica, and exercise in just the next few minutes. Why is integrated medicine important in bone health? Well, it turns out that nutrition, exercise, and nutraceuticals indeed have been shown to improve bone health. And while very effective, the medications that we have prevent only about 50% of the fractures. So by adding integrated approaches, we can decrease the fracture risk even more. Now, this is a paper in a, an important journal, the Journal of Bone and Mural Research, and this was in 2017. And they talked about having fractures being not just because a person's bones become thin, low bone mineral density, osteoporosis. They also often lose muscle and they're more likely to fall and they often have underlying conditions like diabetes and obesity. And it turns out that nutrition and exercise impact all of these and thereby decrease the risk of osteoporotic fractures. Let's look at nutrition. This is in the current report of osteoporosis. This is the Framingham osteoporosis study. And what they found in 2015 is that higher intake of fruit and vegetables is associated with higher bone mineral density and a decreased risk of bone loss over time. And greater protein intake benefits bone mineral density as well and protects against fracture. Now let's look at more about this sarcopenia, which means muscle loss with age, and osteoporosis, which is bone loss with age. It's likely going to happen for all of us, but it turns out that it's more common if we have decreased activity as we get older, if we have decreased protein intake. As we get older, our body actually needs more protein to maintain our muscles and our bones. And if we have illnesses or surgeries, we're likely to lose muscle quickly and bone quickly too. Again, from that Framingham osteoporosis study, they found that people that had about 90 two grams of protein per day, that's about 1.5 grams per kilogram per day, were much less likely to develop functional integrity loss, that is to become weak and have falls and fractures. And this 1.5 kilograms of protein a day, or about 92 grams a day, is higher than what the RDA, the recommended daily allowances of protein. Now let me show you some more studies on protein intake. This is remarkable data by Dr. Douglas Patton Jones, who's a researcher at the University of Texas and a researcher at NASA. And what he found is that most adults have about eat about 90 grams of protein a day, but they only eat a small amount of protein for breakfast and lunch. You can see those blue bars on the left and have a big dose of protein, 60 or more grams for dinner. It turns out that adults can only absorb about 30 grams of protein and assimilate into muscle at any one meal. So if you have meals with a large amount of protein, you end up wasting that. That's called an anabolic waste of the protein. You can still use it for uh, energy, but you can't really use it for, for muscle development. So for breakfast and lunch that day, they're not very likely to build much muscle. And at dinner, 
uh, with a large meal, um, you end up wasting some of that protein. And what he found is that with elderly folks that have illness or astronauts that are in a weightless environment, if they have about 30 grams of protein for three meals and spread that 90 grams of protein out over the three meals, they're much more likely to build muscle. What does 30 grams of protein look like? Well, it's about four ounces of chicken or fish or beef, about a cup or a cup and a half of Greek yogurt, a cup and a half or so of beans, and interestingly, an egg is about seven grams of protein. So if you're planning to get enough protein from eggs, you'd have to have about four. Let's look at vitamin D. It turns out that in following large groups of people over time, adults that have a vitamin D level of about 50 have the lowest all-cause mortality. That means dying for any reason before 75 at these higher levels of vitamin D. And as the vitamin D level goes down, the risk of dying prematurely goes up. We know for, for adults that a level between about 40 and 60 nanograms per milliliter is optimal. And for most adults, they'll need 2,000 to 5,000 IU international units of vitamin D daily. And if their level's low, we often give them 5,000 to 10,000 daily for eight to 12 weeks to get their level up to this optimal range of 40 to 60. Okay, how much calcium? 35% of adults take calcium supplements, and I think many are taking too much. There's probably a sweet spot of about 1,000 milligrams of calcium a day for an adult. That means the amount we get in our food plus the amount we get in supplements needs to be 1,000 or a little bit more. If we get calcium from our food, there's an amazing margin of safety, no real issues. But if we're taking calcium in supplements and we take a large supplement like 500 milligrams of calcium carbonate once or twice a day, we get an acute rise, a, a very quick rise of calcium in our bloodstream, and it can lead to blood vessel calcifications called vascular calcifications, and it can lead to things like kidney stones. Interestingly as well, in many of my adults, it also worsens constipation. What I recommend for most folks concerned about their bones, is about is a terrific diet, and I'll show you the sources of that. And if they're not getting 1,000 milligrams in their diet, to add 150 to 200 milligrams of calcium citrate. I think calcium citrate is the best form, and do that once or twice daily. So a cup of milk has 276 milligrams of calcium. Terrific. So that's eight ounces of milk. But look at this. Bok choy has 158 milligrams in just one cup, and a cup of broccoli has 74 milligrams. Five dried figs have 135 milligrams. There's plenty in chia seeds and in sesame seeds and in fish and in orange juice. So if we eat a whole food, colorful, nutrient-dense diet, we're likely to get enough calcium. Let's look at vitamin K2. Vitamin K is known for coagulation and it helps our blood coagulate when, it, when we need it to, say with a minor cut or a more serious injury. Vitamin K2 is really not a coagulation vitamin, but it's more to do with the health of our bones and the health of our blood vessels. And we found out recently that vitamin K2 increases this protein called osteocalcin, which is part of the matrix of the bone. And so if we get enough vitamin K2, we can actually help mineralize our bones. Interestingly as well, vitamin K2 also increases a protein called matrix GLA protein. And this is the protein that keeps the calcium in our blood vessels low. So it decreases vascular calcification. So that's fabulous. So vitamin K2 does exactly what we want it to. It's a traffic cop. It helps push and keep the calcium in the bones where we need it and keep the calcium out of the arteries where we don't want it to be. Let's look at this extraordinary nexus of estrogen, GI barrier function, inflammation, probiotics, calcium, and bone health. This is terrific research that's come to bear just over the last few years. We know that estrogen deficiency happens in women when they're menopausal. Estrogen is also low when women lactate, when they're breastfeeding their babies. And the reason uh, estrogen is low at that case it is it allows for the for the lactation to occur and it actually increases calcium in the blood for the woman so in lactation 
when estrogen is low, it increases the absorption of calcium from our bones and it's terrific for the baby and provides calcium for the breast milk. In menopause, it leads to osteoporosis. Now in younger women, they're able that are lactating in the years after lactation, they're able to quickly build their bones back once their estrogen is normal. So what happens is when estrogen goes low, there's a compromise of the GI barrier. And I'll show you some pictures of this in the next couple slides. And that increases inflammation in the body and actually turns on the osteoclast, which is a specific cell in the bone that breaks down the bone, the osteoclast. And interestingly, probiotics help heal this GI barrier function. So let's look at this more carefully. In the state where a woman has the natural amounts of estrogen, up at the top, you can see what is the lining of the GI tract. That's those cells across the top. And across the top of those cells are these little cells that would be the bacteria inside the GI tract. So when there's enough estrogen, those cells with the blue dots in them form a, a complete barrier and don't allow any of the bacteria to come through to cause inflammation. In this situation, in menopause and in lactation when estrogen is low, the GI barrier function decreases and there's opening of the tight junctions between those cells that allows bacteria to come through and turn on the immune system, specifically these TH17 cells. And these go to the bone and they turn on the osteoclast and break down our bone and provides calcium for breast milk but also causes osteoporosis in elderly women. Now, interestingly, probiotics do an amazing benefit to the GI barrier by actually tightening the junctions, increasing the proteins that allow those cells, that barrier in the GI tract, to restore itself. Um, and, and they also produce a group of bacteria called clostridia in the GI tract that creates a, a, a molecule called butyrate that turns down inflammation as well. So uh, probiotics are very helpful for bone health. Now along these lines, it turns out that estrogen replacement in menopausal women can, that have few risk for taking estrogen can significantly improve their bone health. And in the very large study called the Women's Health Initiative, women who took estrogen or estrogen and progest progestin had a 33% decreased risk of hip fracture. And very importantly, that the women that took the estrogen had no increased risk of dying from taking the estrogen and had no increased risk of dying from breast cancer, even though they took the estrogen. Very important. And folks that are interested in this online, you can see the North American Menopause Society position statement of 2017 that's widely available. And there's a wonderful book that's 2018 called Estrogen Matters by Dr. Blooming. Now this slide, we're talking about silica. And in the Framingham study, again, they showed that people that ate more silica in their diet had stronger bones. And in this additional study in 2013, they showed that people that were given silica supplements, 10 to 30 milligrams a day, had stronger bones, and we often recommend that in the integrative medicine clinic as well. Let's look at exercise. Well, we always have told women to go for a walk. And Dr. Laura John Gregorio, who is a very famous musculoskeletal physiologist in Canada, said that exercise should be the very first therapy we use for bone health because it not only makes the bone stronger, but it makes the muscles stronger and makes people less likely to fall. She said that walking is a terrific exercise for health, but it's not sufficient to build bone. And then instead, we need some progressive resistance training where we actually lift some weights, push some weights over our head or lift weights from the ground or do squats and these sorts of things to really build bone. When we do this, we increase the type 2 muscle fibers, and this is responsible for strength and the responsiveness that helps us decrease the likelihood of falling. And we need to do balance challenging exercises like this, Tai Chi, for example. Those adults that are doing Tai Chi in that picture are significantly less likely to fall 
has been shown in studies, and actually there's been some evidence that it increases their bone mineral density as well. Yoga can be used it as well. Now, if you look at the top, are yoga positions that are recommended. At the bottom, these ones with hyperflexion, flexing forward very far, or extending backward very aggressively, those are not recommended. Other exercises that are recommended are things where we gradually improve our functional strength. So if you look at the bottom left, you see this man squatting appropriately. Uh, towards the middle, you see him doing step-ups. He actually had, has weights in his hands or bridges or, or lunges or these push-ups starting with a wall push-up and then a desk push-up and finally a knee push-up. These progressive functional movements help us manage um, gravity better in our life, help us stay stronger and improve our bone health. So in summary, complementary therapies for bone health. We want to exercise to build strength and balance. We want terrific nutrition, nutrient dense and colorful with plenty of protein. Estrogen may be helpful for many women in menopause to support their bone health and it can be used safely. Protein 30 milligrams per meal at least twice daily. Vitamin D optimize your level to about 40 to 60. Calcium of about 1,000 milligrams per day optimally from your diet, and then maybe a little bit of supplementation. Vitamin K2, which we know helps to keep the calcium in the bones and not in our arteries. Probiotics uh, daily, olive oil, three to four tablespoons daily, and silica. Silica is amazing in regards to helping bone health. So that said, this has been a talk on how to improve your bones naturally from Dr. Chris Link and Integrative Medicine Clinic. I hope you enjoyed it. Please give us a call if we can help you improve your health and in particular your bone health.